surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to remain standing for the reading of the gospel. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. I assure you that whoever doesn't enter into the sheep pen through the gate, but climbs over the wall is a thief and an outlaw. The one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The guard at the gate opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Whenever he has gathered all of his sheep, he goes before them and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger but will run away because they don't know the stranger's voice. Those who heard Jesus use this analogy didn't understand what he was saying. So Jesus spoke again. I assure you that I am the gate of the sheep. All who come before me were thieves and outlaws, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief enters only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came so that they could have life, indeed so that they could have life to the fullest. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I don't know about you, but when I grew up at home, my living room was made for company. We were not allowed in the living room unless company was coming, except for the fact that our television set was in the living room, and you've already heard me tell you that story. On a Saturday night, it was Lawrence Welk. On a Sunday night, it was uh, Walt World of Walt Disney. It was only turned on at certain times, but otherwise... When we gathered as a family together, if company came, you sat around the kitchen table and you had a good meal. And when dinner was over, my mother would say, now let's all go to the living room and have a seat. And I'll bring dessert into the living room. Well, that was good only when we had company there. Otherwise, we always had to eat our food at the kitchen table. So we really liked when company came because then we got to have our pie in the living room. Now, all of the big people got to sit on the furniture. Us kids would sit on the, on the floor around the coffee table, and that's where we would have our plate that would have our pie on and our drink that would go with it. Living rooms are made for company. Maybe that's too broad a statement, but for the most part, I think you'd probably agree when company visits, we don't say, let's all go to the bathroom. Or, let's all go to the laundry room. We invite them to the living room. And yet, the living room is probably the least lived-in room in your house. Wouldn't you agree? I have a beautiful living room there at the parsonage. And I have a, a puppy gate across the doorway to keep my animals from going in and getting on the sofa and on the chairs and the recliners. And I, myself, really don't spend a whole lot of time in there because I want to keep it pretty, just in case company comes. I was raised that way. Depending on the traffic flow of your home, you might find it difficult to say that a lot of living happens in that living room. But not enjoying the living room of your home may not matter all that much. But I do pray that you enjoy life, the abundant living that Jesus died to win for you. You see, Jesus told us, I came that they might have life and that they might have it abundantly. What is God's living room like? Well, you've never seen a living room like this before. Our Lord, he's not interested in a space marked off as living room that in reality doesn't have much living going on in it. Jesus is interested in us in our living real life. Our God has built his living room on the foundation of Christ. 
and Jesus' unconditional love. He, in fact, designed Christ's life mission so that we would live the abundant life that he had in mind for us. So how do we go about living this abundant life by God's design? You heard him read from the passage in Ephesians, watch what God does, and then do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Now, parents, I want you to listen close. Your children watch everything that you do, and they're going to imitate everything that you do. A close friend of mine from uh, Norton has a two-year-old grandson that on occasion I have uh, babysat for. And on one afternoon, I was babysitting for him, and he and I were sitting on the sofa, and she had a coffee table in front of the sofa. And so I propped my feet up on that coffee table. And last week, she sent me a picture of Caden falling asleep, all of three foot tall, and his feet were on the coffee table, his head was on the couch, and the rest of his body was kind of in between there. He had fallen asleep, and she wrote a little caption to her picture on my cell phone that said, see what you taught him? Every time he comes to her house, that's the first place he heads, the middle of her sofa, and scooches his little behind to the edge of the sofa so he can reach his feet on the coffee table. And I said back, I'm glad I gave him a legacy, something to remember me by. <laughs> That's the same thing with God. He wants to leave you with a legacy, something to remember why you came this morning into his living room. And that's really where you are today. You are sitting in the heart of God's home, in his living room. And I want to share with you five ways to enjoy God's living room. Are you with me? No falling asleep in the living room, even though the sofa might be really comfortable to take a nap on or your recliner or your easy chair. I want you to pay attention. First of all, watch how God lives, how Jesus lived while he was here on earth. Think about those persons in your own life that have influenced you towards Jesus Christ. They could have been a parent or a teacher or a co-worker or maybe even your best friend. Jesus made just as many friends as he did enemies during his ministry. Not everyone agreed with what he was teaching, nor did the people agree with all of the teachings we have today. He didn't condone lifestyles of everyone, but the one thing he taught us was that he loved us no matter what we did. He touched the lepers. He healed the blind. He went out of his way to make people feel welcome. Can we say the same, or do we sometimes only want our kind to come into God's living room? People who reflect our values or our dress code, are they only the ones wanted here? I would hope not. That's not how Jesus lived. Jesus told the disciples to shake the dust off their feet from their sandals when they were in a community that didn't accept them. We say that our church is open to everyone who comes inside. I'm sure that it is. Second, you are to keep company with Jesus. If you're sitting in your living room or in your family room, if you're watching a program on television that has a lot of violence in it, um, perhaps it's the Rocky's Horror Picture Show. I don't know. Is that something that Jesus wants you to watch? Remember that wherever you are in your living room, Jesus is right there sitting on the sofa beside you. He might even be sitting in your lap. And so the books that you read, the programs you watch on television, if Jesus were to be sitting next to you, would that be the program that you would have turned on? Would you want him to see what you're taking into your heart and into your mind? The passage in John reflects the importance of inviting Jesus into our lives for protection, to receive his unconditional love, the shepherd. I brought my shepherd's crook, and, and this is a real authentic shepherd's crook, hand hung on a 
sheep farm down um, southeast of Geneseo, Kansas. When I served in the congregation at Geneseo, um, Marlon Shuttleworth and her husband, Marion, uh, raised sheep. And in the springtime, they would invite me to their sheep shearing and to the lambing season of the year. And they had sheep running everywhere. And I don't know about you, but I don't have a sense of smell. I lost it as a child. But I could smell those sheep. <laughs> they are the stinkiest things I've ever been around. Their lamb's wool is matted and just plain awful. But I went by invitation because I was the shepherd of the Shuttleworth family. And I helped in that sheep shearing. And I had to wear, if you've ever seen people that are going through nuclear disasters or cleaning up after a bombing or something, you have to put on these white clothes and, and a shield and all. I had to wear all of that stuff and big, heavy uh, gloves, not because I didn't want to get too close to the sheep, but ever since I was a child, I've been allergic to wool. And if I came in contact with those cute little furry little lambs, my eyes would start to water, and then they'd quickly go shut, and I'd break out in hives everywhere. And we soon discovered going out and helping with the sheep shearing was not the thing for the preacher to do. So in honor of not being able to do that, this is what I got. They said, when you go from one appointment to the next, you are the shepherd of the church, and every shepherd needs a shepherd's crook. Not only to reel in the people, as we tried with our little girl here that did not work very well, but also to let you know that Christ is among us, that my love for you is the same as my love for my own family. We are to live in the company of Jesus every moment of every day. And if we can't do that, if we have to monitor what we're doing, then we need to take a second look at our lives and, and how we're living it. Third, we need to learn to live a life of love from him and not of selfishness from the world. How many of you have brothers and sisters? How many of you have always gotten along with your brothers and sisters? Good. I'm glad there's some back there that have. My sister Lois is seven years older than I, and I was her abominable shadow. Everywhere she went, I wanted to go. Everything she did, I wanted to do. But there were some privileges because of her age being so much older than I that she could do and I couldn't. And I didn't like that. I'll be honest. I was the baby of the family, and I was the brat. I openly admit that. And I would do things. We shared a bedroom. I always got to sleep on the side by the wall. And, of course, in the middle of the night, you have to get up and you have to go. And that meant I either had to crawl over her or go down to the end of the bed and go around and get up. And she complained because... I was always waking her up to go. And soon when she got married, and I was probably, uh, I think, a sophomore, junior in high school by the time she got married. And um, then I missed her. I didn't have anybody to fuss and fight with anymore. I was the one left at home on the farm to do all of the chores, to feed the hundred head of black Angus, and to drive the tractor, and to bale the hay with my dad, and it wasn't so fun anymore. My mother found a way to help Lois and I get along with one another. One of the few times you got to use the living room, other than when company came, is if she and I were at odds with each other, my mother would bring us into the living room, and she would sit us down on the sofa, and she would sit across from us in her chair, and she would say, the two of you are going to sit there until you work things out. You cannot go anywhere, you cannot do anything until you apologize to one another. Of course, you know how that goes. 
I didn't do it. I'm not going to say it first. Was it my fault? She got it. Did she say it first? Learning to live a life of love from Jesus and not from the selfishness of the world. We soon learned if we wanted to get anywhere, we had to quit being bossy with each other and get along. As adults, we get along better now than we ever did when we were kids growing up. It just happens to be that way. God called her home in 2007. And now my new relationship is with her two daughters and her two sons. And we continue to get together. And that's why when I first came into this appointment, I said to the staff parish, I said, can I um, like tweak the schedule just a little bit? I know I'm supposed to be here on July 1st and 2nd. How about if I be in the office on the 29th and 30th and take the 1st and 2nd? And you see, her youngest daughter and her family were in Colorado Springs. And they said, Aunt Lynn, can you come and play in the Garden of the Gods with us and climb Pike's Peak? And so I did. A life of love from Christ goes far. And in the same way, Jesus' saving love is poured into our hearts every day that we may embrace that love and share it with others. Number four. Love extravagantly. Don't hold anything back. Now, men, I want to talk to you for just a moment. Do you remember that moment that you set your eye on the woman you're sitting beside? And how, what great lengths you went to to get her into your grips? You know, when you used to open the car door or you used to pull the chair out when you go out to dinner at a restaurant? How many of you can honestly sit here and say, we still do that? Don't answer that because I don't want you to get in trouble when you get home. <laughs> love extravagantly. Don't hold back. Christ loved us extravagantly to the point that he was willing to give up his very life on the cross. There is no greater unconditional love than to give up your life for a friend. Christ's unconditional love, his extravagance was just that. He gave his very life for each one of us. There isn't anything that I wouldn't do for any of my children, for any of you, because you are all my children, because we are sheep of one flock, and I am the shepherd of the flock. And last of all, Number five, live and love, not because you're looking for something in return, but because Christ first loved you and gave his life for you. It's easy to relax in the living room. It can be a place to walk into at the end of the day, kick off your shoes and take a nap. It's a place to gather with family, to talk about your day and share the good and the bad. It's a place to hold a family conference, like I said, to discuss issues that affect your life and love in Christ. Paul wrote to encourage us to take time to lift one another up and our needs and our wants to the Lord in prayer. Pray with supplication, with thanksgiving. He reminds us that when we come to the Lord in prayer, the peace of God that transcends all understanding is going to be right there. So I invite you this week to take time out of your living room as a family and simply be in the presence of God, to close your eyes and reflect on the gifts that God has already given you and your family and invite Christ to show you how to truly live and love. I also invite you to come back this evening at 5 o'clock as we take a closer look at the Gospel of John and exactly how the sheepfold reflects Christ's abundant love for us. My challenge for you is to love extravagantly and hold nothing back. Be at peace with one another and peace with God. Amen. <laughs>